so hello, I'm Hannah Dawson, um, and I'm here to chair this event on feminist classics. What is a feminist classic? I've got two writers of feminist classics either side of me. I have um, Charlene Tew um, here, born in Singapore, um, began with a degree in law, but then went on to do a, a creative writing degree at the University of East Anglia, where she won the Booker Prize Foundation Scholarship and the David T. K. Wong Creative Writing Award. And her first novel um, is Ponty. Uh, which itself won the Deborah Rogers Writers' Award. Um, and here we have Sarah Collins, who also studied law and then also went on to do a creative writing degree, um, this time at Cambridge. Um, and there she won the Michael Holroyd Prize and was shortlisted for the Lucy Cavendish Prize for the book that turned into her first novel, The Confessions of Franny Langton. Um, and so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to begin by um, picking out from our uh, minds feminist classics um, to sort of set the discussion going. Um, uh, so I'm going to begin by, by, by picking one of my own favourites. Um, so I'm a historian of ideas. I work on the history of the Enlightenment, that period in uh, European history when um, people ceased to think of themselves as kind of naturally, automatically subject to power, but free and equal, and the, the makers of their own destiny. And so I grew up, I mean, I, I learned at university, I read and now I teach at university writers like Hobbes and Locke and Hume. And after a while of, of reading these texts and teaching these texts, I thought, where am I? Am I? not in the Enlightenment? Where are the women in the Enlightenment? And then I read Mary Wollstonecraft, who is my, uh, my chosen favourite uh, for now. And, um, and she was another woman who found herself kind of in the shadow of the Enlightenment um, and, uh, and wondered where she fitted within that. Um, and that the sort of move that she made in her life feels very much like a move that, that feminists make as a matter of course, a kind of move into enlightenment. So there she was at the end of the 18th century, looking across the water at the French Revolution, thinking it was the best thing she'd ever seen. These people standing up for their rights, fighting for liberty and equality. And she thought she was, she was one of the guys. So along with you know, Tom Paine writing um, The Rights of Man, she wrote a vindication of the rights of men because she thought that she was part of mankind. And then she watched the French Revolution unfold and found that she wasn't included in that, that women were excluded from the polity. And it was that that led her to write Vindication of the Rights of Woman, which is, of course, the classic feminist text um, that you're probably all familiar with and that is, is my uh, great love of mine. Um, and I just want to pull out an idea, one idea from that text, which I think speaks still very powerfully to us now. Um, and, and that is her idea about what happens to a human being when they find themselves in a situation of oppression, when they find themselves under the power of others. In this case, women under the power of men. And what she says um, happens in that situation is that if you are dependent on the will of another for your life, for your safety, for your property, that you turn your entire self to pleasing that person. You twist your entire interiority towards that other. You lose your selfhood um, in order to kind of fluff up the ego of the other. Um, and that strikes me as a very sort of powerful account of the mechanism whereby um, domination works. Oh dear, we've already lost them. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I, I'm making sure that we don't lose anybody else. I'm now going to turn <laughs> to, um, to Sarah um, um, to talk to you about said. your... Yeah, exactly. 
Uh, thank you very much. I, um, my name is Sarah Collins and I am delighted to be here and I think I should start out by explaining why I'm delighted to be here. Um, so I've had this sort of dream come true experience where my debut novel is about to be published. It's due on the 4th of April, um, which has involved a lot of promotion, much more promotion than I was expecting. And during the course of promoting my novel, I've noticed a really strange phenomenon, which is that many people have noticed that I'm black, but this is the first time someone noticed that I was also a woman. Mm -hmm. And so I have appeared on a number of panels now talking about blackness, mm -hmm. so much so that I've come to the conclusion I need to let people know I'm not a professional black person, but a professional <laughs> writer. And I really am delighted to discover that I am also a woman. Um, and it's a pleasure to talk about feminism because I think the novel I wrote is as much in the feminist tradition as it is an attempt to write against some racial stereotypes about historical fiction. Um, and so it's about a young Jamaican woman called Franny Langton who is brought to London in the early 19th century by her owner who gives her as a gift to a famous natural philosopher. And Franny starts working as a maid in the Mayfair mansion of this philosopher and becomes very attracted to her mistress, who is this enigmatic, perpetually dissatisfied French woman, who, by the way, worships Wollstonecraft, mm -hmm. um, and who says of mm -hmm. her husband that essentially um, a woman is crucified if she aims at respect instead of love. But what Wollst Wollstonecraft failed to say is that she's crucified by the very man who's supposed to love her. Because Madame Benham, as she's known, is very much under her husband's thumb. She's suffering from what she herself would call the agony of suppressed ambition. So the two of them embark on this very twisted affair. And months later, Franny is accused of the double murder of Benham and his wife. And she's convinced that she didn't murder Madame. She thinks she was asleep the whole time. But why has this happened to her? And the novel is her attempt to find out. Um, the thing that, that I think we need more of in literature and that I think um, uh, would reflect our current context is anger. And one of the live wires that drove me to write a novel was anger. I think anger is an appropriate response to experiences of oppression. And I think we don't allow ourselves enough of it in our art. And so I wanted to start with just a few snippets that tie together this thread or this theme of anger, ending in the classic text that I have chosen, um, which is Jane Eyre. My book, uh, I have described it before. It was inspired by my sort of childhood love of Gothic romance, but especially Jane Eyre, which was a book I read and reread. And I like to think I've sort of conceived of the kind of novel that would have been Jane Eyre had Jane been accused of cuckolding and murdering Mr. Rochester, <laughs> which quite frankly, I think may be a better plot line, but I am biased. Um, <clears throat> it struck me as well, and I'm going to say it just because I do want, I think we need to have an honest discussion that, you know, when we were invited to talk about classic texts and I looked through the list and I look around the room, I see very few classic texts written by people who look like me. Um, and so, you know, I've been both a conformist by picking Jane Eyre and a rebel by picking Audre Lorde, Sister Outsider. And I want to start with a little snippet from her essay, The Uses of Anger, Woman Responding to Racism. Woman responding to racism means woman responding to anger, the anger of exclusion, of unquestioned privilege, of racial distortions, of silence, ill use, stereotyping, defensiveness, misnaming, betrayal, and co-optation. My anger is a response to racist attitudes and to the actions and presumption, presumptions that arise out of those attitudes. If your dealings with other women reflect those attitudes, then my anger and your attendant fears are spotlights that can be used for growth in the same way I have used learning to express anger for my growth, but for corrective surgery, not guilt. Guilt and defensiveness are bricks in a wall against which we all flounder. They serve none of our futures. And then I think and hope that that leads me into Jane, 
because I love, um, whenever I think about Jane Eyre, I love what Joyce Carol Oates said about her, which is that you can detect in her this, I'm going to misquote it, but this well of willfulness and longing and scarcely concealed rage. And I think this might be, for me anyway, it was the first book I encountered about female anger. And that's why it stayed with me so powerfully. And I think what, why it, what drove me to write my own novel about female anger. And I'm just going to read only a paragraph. <coughs> it is vain to say human beings ought to be satisfied with tranquility. They must have action, and they will make it if they cannot find it. Millions are condemned to a stiller doom than mine, and millions are in silent revolt against their lot. Nobody knows how many rebellions besides political rebellions ferment in the masses of life which people earth. Women are supposed to be very calm, generally, but women feel just as men feel. They need exercise for their faculties and a field for their efforts as much as their brothers do. They suffer from too rigid a restraint, too absolute a stagnation, precisely as men would suffer. And it is narrow-minded in their more privileged fellow creatures to say that they ought to confine themselves to making puddings and knitting stockings, to playing on the piano and embroidering bags. It is thoughtless to condemn them or laugh at them if they seek to do more or, or learn more than custom has pronounced necessary for their sex. Fantastic. Thank you. Charlene. Uh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Charlene, um, I wrote a novel called Ponty. Um, and Ponty is basically a short form for a Pontianak, so that's a Southeast Asian mythical entity that eats men. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but the novel doesn't have a real Ponty in it, not literally, but um, it, it centers around a woman named Amisa Tan, who's um, a actress who makes a series of B-horror movies in Singapore between the late 70s and the early 80s that flop spectacularly. <laughs> Um, so it's about her, this like angry monster actress lady, and it's also about her teenage daughter Sue um, growing up in a very kind of claustrophobic, isolated environment um, in Singapore in the early 2000s. And finally, it's about um, Sue's very, very complicated friendship with um, her only friend, uh, Cersei, um, who as an adult um, works as a social media consultant on a remake of the Ponty film. So that's what ties these three women together. And it's very, very much a narrative about all about women and the relationships between women and the complexities of that. And um, at the heart of it, um, a kind of friendship love story between two girls and that kind of tenuous, barbed, competitive dynamic that, that adolescent consciousnesses have, basically. And that's what I'm very interested in. Um, and uh, growing up thinking about feminist classics, I can think of a few off the top of my head. They're all by... Um, white people, <laughs> I couldn't really see my direct um, cultural social reality reflected in fiction. So I think it's really great that now there are a lot more kind of voices and perspectives that are, that are coming out from different places. And I think translation really facilitates that as well. Um, so what was I, I was going to say something. Oh yeah, so basically back to the, back to the Pontiano. She's got like really long black hair. She looks a bit like the girl from The Ring. But mind you, she was, in, she was in like Southeast Asian consciousness from when I was small, like years and years ago, like decades. I mean, I was small, yeah, I was small ages ago, but I mean, for many, <laughs> many, many generations, many generations, um, everyone's been fascinated by this lady. So I, I thought, like, what is, where is the kind of genesis of such a myth? Like, why do we have these particular mythological female figures, especially ones that are kind of sexy? You're like, what is, what is that interesting sort of tension and appeal? someone that looks visually like a kind of young woman appealing um, and the kind of threat, the kind of menace that they represent, like what, what kinds of cultural anxieties are manifested in these myths that, that causes them to kind of endure, you know, in, in, our, in our consciousness and be reinterpreted in stories. I think that's really fascinating. And was it? oh yeah, so I, I brought, I, we were asked to kind of think of sections that were perhaps representative or inter interesting. <laughs> um, so I have uh, the yellow wallpaper. Um, uh, there's so many good sections in this. Um, so like, has, ever, has anyone read it, familiar with the yellow wallpaper? There are a lot of nuts, so I don't need to paraphrase it. Okay, but anyway. Well, tell us a little bit, if you want. Well, 
right? There's a, there's a lady. She's in a house. And um, her, her horrible husband um, makes her co convalesce in a room while she's like recovering from an illness. And he's very, very mean and gaslights her all the time. So I just found a, there are so many sections that are good. I'll just read you a short one. Dear John, he loves me very dearly and hates to have me sick. I tried to have a real earnest, reasonable talk with him the other day and tell him how I wish he would let me go and make a visit to cousin Henry and Julia. But he said I wasn't able to go, nor able to stand it after I got there. I, didn't, I did not make out a very good case for myself, for I was crying before I had finished. It is getting to be a great effort for me to think straight. Just this nervous weakness, I suppose. And dear John gathered me up in his arms and just carried me upstairs and laid me on the bed, sat by me and read to me till it tired my head. He said I was his darling and his comfort and all he had, and that I must take care of myself for his sake and keep well. He says no one but myself can help me out of it, that I must use my will and self-control and not let any silly fancies run away with me. There's one comfort, the baby is well and happy and does not have to occupy this nursery with the horrid wallpaper. Great, thank you. So unsurprisingly, I guess you both, um, well, no, you didn't, you chose nonfiction. I mean, that's good. So you chose a nonfiction of Audre Lorde and you chose a novel. And I suppose one way of kind of opening um, up this discussion is for us to think about what a feminist text is. Um, I mean, obviously there are kind of explicitly feminist manifestos like the second sex, Simone de Beauvoir's second sex, you know, which makes the claim that gender is a construction as opposed to, um, uh, as opposed to something given in nature, that womanhood is a myth imposed upon us as opposed to something that we're born to. Um, um, and, and yet a lot of us, I think, find our feminism or feel our consciousness raising with the experience of reading literature, of reading novels. So I wonder if, if you would like to say something about the way in which a novel might be feminist. Well, I mean, I think, I think that as hu human beings, I'm not a neurosurgeon, but I think that we're, we're, <laughs> we're that obviously, no, obvi I wish, no. But I think we're, we're, we're cognitively sort of oriented toward um, absorbing and receiving and accepting kinds of ideas and truths and realities when they're, when they're served as a story. So we, we are really wired for narrative. So I think when I was growing up in Singapore, um, I, I, I remember just being in particular social situations and feeling kind of mad. But I wasn't really just mad from myself, like as a girl um, growing up in, in a particular society and um, societal structure. But I was, I was kind of mad for everyone, like how everyone felt like they, had, they were bound to these rigid rules. I, I felt sorry for boys as well, like you know, having to perform mm. in a particular way. And I didn't really feel like there was any outlet or any way for me to verbalize um, this kind of discontentment. It was, it was kind of in Kuwait. It was kind of bu bubbling in, in my chest, you know, just this feeling of I don't know how to articulate it. Um, and I think when I read particular novels that really kind of centered mm. or emphasized um, social relations, um, kind of patriarchal structures mm. that really hurt people, that really damaged them, um, Particularly people from hundreds of years ago, and I think when you're when you're really when you're young, when you're you know say 17, 15 even, you know pe people in their twenties seem quite old. Let alone you know twenties in the seventeen hundreds or the eighteen hundreds. You're like you're really really old, but <laughs> and dead. But um, why why can I really relate to the the kinds of emotional complexities that I remember reading Madame Bovary when I I mean that's by a man, but. I thought, what's what's so bad about her? She doesn't. She doesn't. She really gets it bad, doesn't she? She just, you know. And I feel like, you know, if you if you reoriented her kinds of like very very justifiable melancholy and frustrations to like contemporary age, you know, things would have turned out differently for her. There's nothing wrong with enjoying a bit of, you know, retail therapy. <laughs> so I mean, so I, I think there there is a real function for um, you know mm. feminist texts that mm. yeah. As a, as a consolation. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to unapologetically wave the flag for novels as a novelist. I, um, I always feel that there's more distance between me and a text that, is, that says it's telling me the truth mm -hmm. and one that tells me it's a lie. Mm -hmm. I sink straight into the lie and I lap it up. And mm -hmm. I think that's why I love fiction and why I became a novelist. 
Um, there is such tremendous power in novels. I am sure I got my sense of who I am as a woman from them. And I can think of, you know, mm. characters like Elizabeth Bennet and Joe March mm. and the characters that stay with us and somehow become part of our DNA. Mm. Even after the books themselves go out of date, because I was thinking about this last night when I was selecting this text, Jane Eyre, and how much Jane Eyre bugs me. Because, you know, when I read it as an adult, the first thing I noticed was how much of an asshole Mr. Rochester is mm -hmm. and how little I had appreciated that when I was reading it as an impressionable woman. Arguably Jane Eyre is not a feminist text at all because Jane circles her way, way back to a man who in my opinion is not worthy of her. But somehow Jane herself and her sort of burning anger has fueled and inspired my life as a woman. She remains, and the text remains timeless, even though it doesn't really fit into the context of what modern women would describe as feminism. Um, and I think one couldn't say that about, you know, you could pick up some nonfiction books. You know, Wollstonecraft, for example, was, was um, advocating within the limits of her circumstances and her range of knowledge. And fiction is timeless in a way that perhaps those non-fiction texts don't quite manage, in my opinion. But I also have to say there is a negative aspect for me anyway about this power that fiction has. And it's one I've thought about all my life because I grew up so madly in love with these books. Yeah. But I was really trying to fit myself mm -hmm. into clothes that were too tight, let's say. I was trying to imagine myself as Elizabeth Bennet, you know, sitting in a small island in the Caribbean with, yeah. um, you know, maybe a breadfruit tree and trying to imagine what these horses they were all riding looked like or, yeah. or what it would feel like to be cold. You know, it was an yeah. exercise in, in aligning my identity with something I didn't really understand and couldn't quite conceive, mm. which I think other readers probably didn't experience the same way. And that was both beneficial and detrimental. It was beneficial because I feel that fiction gave me that power to expand my own consciousness to include other people and that everyone should get that from fiction. That there's no way to read fiction and be a tyrant. But it was detrimental mm. because, as I've said in other contexts, those books I loved didn't love me back. There is something really alienating about being obsessed with books that never reflect your own experience. And I go back to what I said earlier about being recognized as a woman. You know, most of the classic feminist texts mm. will never speak about the experience of being a black woman unless we start redefining what we mean by feminist and classic. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I end on that negative note that there's a lot of, there's a lot of good, there's a lot of positive, there's a lot mm. of change that we can affect through writing fiction. But I think as Charlene said, our current challenge is to make sure that we're including all voices. Yes, yes. So perhaps a way of sort of extrapolating from what you, from what you both said is to think about that novels might be feminist insofar as we can find ourselves on the page. And if one thinks, you know, for, for most of history about what has been written, about what has been canonical, it was the words of men and of white men. Um, and it's in, in, in a sense, you know, feminist texts, feminist novels are feminist insofar as they center female experience, insofar as woman is written there, as it were, for the first time. I mean, I was thinking, as, as you were both talking about um, Svetlana Alexeyevich's The Unwomanly Face of War. I don't know, I think that is in the um, classics, yeah. And um, I mean, and in, just to sort of bring in another um, kind of genre. So we've had, we've thought about um, manifestos, we've thought about novels, but with, with um, Svetlana's book, she, um, it's a kind of reportage. It's about um, what she does is she thinks about, she goes and interviews um, the many, many women who were part of the war effort in the Second World War, uh, the Soviet war effort. And she just reports their stories and puts their voices, as it were, unmediated onto the page. And so suddenly there are women snipers and it's as though they kind of, you know, in writing them, they rise up in an identity. I mean, they rise up as themselves and they hadn't been there before. That sort of that way in which writing incarnates um, a, a person or, a, or, a, or an identity that really hadn't been there before, insofar as it hadn't been there in, in the kind of readers' minds. I mean, that's why that's why um, 
I, I, there's a really welcome sort of shift towards retellings. Or, yes. Or, um, you know, different perspectives of yes. canonical narratives. So, like, I'm yeah. thinking of Pat Barker's Silence of the Girls. Mm -hmm. Cersei, Madeline Miller, just brilliant. Yes. And there's so many others. There's so much more potential um, for that, I think. We have whole troves of stories and myths. Yes. Yeah, and this idea yeah. that in writing we rise up. I, I mean, I think we have mm. to acknowledge the real creative power and the ability yes. of that creative power to affect change and how, how, how it's a measure of power and humanity if you have access to it. Now, there's a line in my novel where Franny is, um, she's explaining why she's writing her autobiograph autobiography and she says, um, men write to separate themselves from the common history, but women write to try to join it. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. that, yeah. Yeah. yeah, to me that, it was, it was kind of, it was sort of my line in a way, because mm. writing yeah. is <laughs> the way you assert yourself as a person. Mm. And to think about the huge weight, mm. tragic weight of the suffering of people who did not have that outlet, you know, who couldn't express themselves in that way. And what a deprivation of power it really was. You know, how, you know, there are mm. all these men sort of swanning around with their egos and we've inherited, yes. you know, their musings, whether we wanted them or not. And those women who were shut out, yes. who did not become a part of history. Mm. Um, you know, so that's why reportage is important, nonfiction is important, fiction is important, because that's really how we create selves and sort of stamp those selves on the world. I mean, I wonder what you think about, so a lot of the feminist texts that we like are apparently, I mean, Madame Bovary, she's got some retail therapy, she has some good times in the stack, <laughs> but, no, I know we love her, we love her, but, 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 but uh, and I should say, um, no. she, there's also been, we've, we've thought about angry women, we've thought about miserable women. I mean, the weird thing, I mean, certainly when I was reflecting on kind of, you know, where I let my feminism, it was partly and weirdly by kind of reading about miserable lives. I mean, if I think, I mean, I love, I love uh, Jane Eyre. I also love Villette. Have you read Villette? I mean, that is a really sad book. You know, I mean, she does, I mean, Jane Eyre, although, you know, she, he has to go blind for it to come to a denouement. Um, <laughs> with Villette, I mean, she lives, it's a massive book. It's a massive classic. And, uh, and for the most of it, it's about this extraordinarily sort of ill-fitting, as she understands herself, ugly person who lives the most confined life. She's got all sorts of stuff going on inside her, but there's no way in which it can quite find a way out or an expression or any kind of happiness. And when just towards the end of the book, she gets within a reach of happiness, her love, should I tell her? <laughs> <laughs> Something really bad happens. <laughs> And that's it. It's the end of the book. I mean, it's the saddest book. And you think, and, but, and yet it is weirdly feminist. And so what is that about? Is that about the fact that as, if feminism is anything, it's about the identification of the oppression of women and therefore, insofar as that's realized on the page, that's, that's a kind of, that's a feminist experience? I mean, maybe it what could be as simple as... Um, there aren't any good novels in happy lives. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. speaking Maybe as a it's novelist. Maybe a point about novels, right, as opposed to feminism. <laughs> um, That's interesting. You know, yes. misery and obstacle yes. and anger and unhappiness is what the, sort of the Graham, the Graham Greene quote, right, he says, like, um, yeah. happiness is really difficult to write. Like, sadness, yeah. okay. you can write yes. novels and novels about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Because you, you do need something to fuel a novel. Um, yeah. But I think also it's, I mean, so again, I'm probably the weird one, but I love misery and tragedy. And um, that's why I think I was drawn to, so it's interesting because I wrote a Gothic novel because I like Gothic fiction, but, but I also don't, uh, there's something about early Gothic fiction that troubles me, you know, all those sort of maidens with their sort of breathless, fast heartbeats being chased through crumbling mansions. You know, that's very Curious much kind of, yes. Um, it, there is a sense in which women who wrote could only do what they could with the constraints of the time period. So, you know, on the one hand, the Gothic form was actually quite empowering for female novelists who couldn't all go off and become Byron. Um, <laughs> you know, there's another line in the book, which I'm going to try and remember it, where Franny's basically chatting with Madame, who she's in love with, and um, Madame reads her a poem and she says, you know, Byron. It, isn't it funny how a man is merely 
soiled by his vices while a woman is soiled by hers, you know. So you get these sort of mad, bad, romantic poets, but the women aren't allowed to be anything. And one way in which they carved out space for themselves mm. was in writing these kind of, mm. I think someone described it as the airport novel of the time, which kind of pissed me off. But mm. it's true, they were the sort of pulpy, mm. you know, and but yet now you look back on them and you think, but they are just stereotypes of female misery or female mm. weakness or, you know, female victimhood, mm, victimhood. Um, mm. which they used because it was the only thing they had available to them mm. they were reflecting reality and I don't mm. think you can can you criticize people for reflecting reality and working with what they had no and um, and clearly it is an important part I mean I think what's what we're sort of getting to is that it is a kind of integral part actually of liberation yes um, even if in the case for example of Villette it is this sort of as it were, you know, it's deeply confined and it's psychological, but there's stuff going on. I mean, Jaina, you know, has those yes. amazing experiences of um, the sensation of breaking the bonds that, um, it, of her mind yes. and becoming, as it were, internally free, which anyway is a complicated... Right. And talk about the yellow wallpaper. I mean, yeah. that's hugely symbolic of that sense of, exactly. of being yeah. sort of locked away, the prison of the mind, as well as how the body is, yes. is, oh, is kept on. A text like White Sargasso Sea. Yes. It's like a post-colonial response to like a canonical yeah. text that really reframes or like makes us re-question like our initial sort of perspective and approach. But I think, I think like widening a kind of feminist approach to the text, I like to think of yeah. it as like, empathizing with the consciousness and really sort of taking into account yes. all the facets of that. So I think there's some books that I read that I feel are not necessarily feminist texts per se, but but they really, really accentuate that the mm. kind of totality of a consciousness. Mm. So I'm thinking of, mm. you, you were thinking, you know, the opposite of a tragedy. Uh, I Capture the Castle by Dodie Smith. Yeah. And that is just um, a really compassionate, mm. delightful portrayal of girlhood. Mm. And I suppose words like delightful get bandied around now as like mm. kind of a way of diminishing the, the mm. kind of appeal or clout of a text. And that's also something which we should talk about, like how, how women's books are packaged. Women's fiction, you know, you got a lady with some flowers pining. It's, it's really annoying. It's not just how <laughs> the books are packaged, but what's yeah. expected of women writers. So, you know, I've had this yeah. experience where um, because there are some should I describe them as challenging scenes in my novel, you know, that I have interesting reactions from readers who will say, oh, you know, that was quite provocative or that was quite controversial. And the same readers won't analyze a text by someone like, say, Marlon James in the same yes. way. And mine, mine doesn't really, yes. my, my book doesn't approach the kind of things that he was dealing with. And I love his work, absolutely love it. But I do feel as if I'm mm. getting a taste now of, of this idea that, the market will tolerate more so-called graphic material from male writers than it will from women. That there's an expectation. Not just the books will be packaged in this mm -hmm. very um, non-confrontational way, but the writers themselves won't tackle those kinds of subjects or in certain kinds of ways. And I find that interesting. I mean, have we come that have we come far enough from the time when women had to write gothic to sort of get mm -hmm. all of that stuff out in a in a disguised way because we're not really allowed an outlet for that kind of emotion anywhere else. Mm. I wonder what you think in relation to that, both of you, about the the question of as, as, of selfhood and writing and, and yourself in relation to your work. So something that's often sort of said about women writing is that they that readers won't, as it were, allow them to speak from a kind of universal viewpoint yes. about their ideas or a story that the question is always is this you yes. um how you're is not, this you're related not to your imagination always, no always yes. okay tell us more about always. that always well i mean there's, i think like siri Huspit has a really incredible mm. um essay about that um that whole kind of discussion of how women and men are, are read and framed yeah um, particularly and she, she was with reference to nasgard who, yeah. who said famously in an interview he doesn't read much many women because you know he doesn't think they're really worth reading. Um, but if you if you contrast like someone who, with his body of work and how he's received yeah. paratextually, you know, as an as a kind of celebrity, um, also like you know as a, as a kind of literary figure yeah. in terms of the clout and the kind of uh, reception of his intellect versus someone else like say Rachel Cusk or, mm. or um, Ferrante, you know, mm. they're operating along. Uh, Sheila Hetty, mm. I mean, autofiction, yeah. these, these lines of, you know, the, the very fascinating blurring of genre and boundaries. In, in a sense, you know, historical accounts are, are acts of subjective 
you yes. know, imagination. Um, everything that you write is fiction in a sense. Yeah. But at the same time, obviously, the, um, I'm sure you get this experience. You know, when you when you do sort of events, like you are read a particular way, and, and yes. you people expect you to explain this correlation between the text and you. You know, as if it's a very thinly veiled account yes. of your life, which is which is really not true. But to an extent, you are everything. I mean, you are mm. you are in every single email that you write. Like, yes, thanks. <laughs> Regards. I mean, that's you, right? There's a little bit of your soul in there dying, <laughs> you know. So that it both is, is a true to sound good. Yeah. And someone asked me, I think a year ago when my book came out, it's almost a year old, like um, how I felt, and I, I feel I felt like really like an egg that a hard boiled egg that had been peeled and just left to kind of rot. Just like no, I mean, I'm, I'm not complaining, but it's, there's a kind of exposure. You just feel kind of like produce. You're just like oh, I'm this weird egg. You know, I, you, you think when you're writing, you're like, oh, you know, when my book comes out, it'll be like that Bjork music video where everyone has her book. You're like, oh, everybody has the book. It's not, it's not like that. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's just kind of freaky and exciting, but you, you do feel answerable to yes. the text in a way that if you were to be aware of that as you're drafting it, you probably would not write anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, and I think, I think, I always think power is measured in adjectives. You know, the more adjectives someone puts before your name or your designation, the less power you have. So, you know, you're a writer, mm. you're at the top of the tree. Mm. You're a woman writer, you're clinging mm. on to a branch. You're a black woman writer, mm. you're falling off of it. Mm -hmm. And on and on and on. Mm. And um, we're still, mm. we've been programmed by mm. so many centuries of discounting the power of women's imagination that we still doubt it. We still mm. think anything a woman writes is domestic, even if it's some, yes. you know, gothic, double murder mystery set in 18-something London, where yes. I can assure you I've never been. <laughs> and everything a man writes is universal, even if it's Nausgaard and his navel-gazing for thousands of pages. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, yeah. that is our programming, isn't it? Yeah. And, and I think even as women, we might be programmed to that. Totally. You know, we, we might have all kinds of unconscious biases. Yes, yes. You know, everybody, everybody, we're all human, so it's, yeah. it's just about kind of identifying them. But, yeah. but I think we don't want, I don't want to move from that. I think you said this as well. I don't want to move from that to discount the autobiographical in my work because mm -hmm. there is a real sense in which my work is fueled by my experiences and my anger and, you know, I'm inspired by that. Right. Um, but I think we must have equal recognition that that's what men do. Yeah. Otherwise, they can do exactly. what Nausgaard did yeah. and what Naipaul did when he said, you know, Jane Austen was yeah. inferior to him and show him a piece of text by a woman and he could tell instantly that a woman wrote it because it will always be beneath him. A and these men are lionized. You know, they're yeah. actually acclaimed. Nobody finds that kind of rhetoric problematic. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I swore never to read Na Naipaul a long time ago because of his problematic views, but, but he is, you know, accounted one of the greats and those are his views about women writers. Now, when he is prescribed and studied coming from that perspective, what does it say to people who are reading exactly. um, fiction by women or women who are attempting to write fiction? Mm, mm. Yeah. It puts me in mind of that sort of core second wave feminist mantra that the personal is political. I mean, the personal is political. I mean, it goes to your point about what's going on in our minds, our unconscious bias, what goes on behind the closed doors of the bedroom. Um, all of that, um, it, uh, as it were, is infused and um, riddled with the operation of power. Um, and there is no space. Uh, the, the, the distinction between the personal and the political, between the experiential and the, um, as it were, the ideational or the philosophical, these are blurred lines um, and where women and men and people of colour and white people are placed in relation to those lines is a deeply kind of political act, which I guess what might take us to thinking about um, the canon, the classics, you know, we're here surrounded, I mean, and you've already talked about this, um, we're here surrounded by these classics, these fantastic classics, Penguin. Yes. Um, um, but and obviously the whole, you know, the canon, so it was always, you know, in, in the, over the last century, um, as it were, the canon was this established male uh, domain, women have been pushing into it, um, but we have to keep pushing, we have to keep on interrogating um, its boundaries. Um, I mean, I don't know if you want to say more about that, or maybe before we open the discussion up. Yeah. In oh, go on, go on, yeah, you say I do yeah. want no, to just do. say about yeah. the classics, just yeah. in case anyone thought I was putting them down, that I love yeah. so many of these books. I, I think the question I'm asking is, have you considered what it costs me to love them? Yes. Um, and that is a question I've been trying to answer all my life. Uh, so perhaps the idea is, yeah. 
It's a question of gatekeeping. I mean, who has decided, who, who puts these things on the list and who has done? And how do you get on the list? Um, who's, who's, who's holding the gates open or closed? Um, I did a lot of research during the course of writing my novel about black people who have written throughout history. And you know, we all know until actually way too recently, most of the writing black people did was about addressing the emergencies of their lives. So, you know, slave narratives essentially. But Phyllis Wheatley popped up, who was one, uh, accounted as one of the sort of first um, black writers to tackle something mm. other than that. She wrote poetry. And I was struck by this story I came across about how her book got published. And forgive me if you've heard this before, but I hadn't. That she, when she wrote this book, um, there was so much doubt about whether she was actually capable of doing it. Mm. Remember, Thomas Jefferson himself said, no black has ever uttered a thought above the level of plain narration. So that was the context in which she produced these poems. There was so much doubt about whether she could have been the real author that she had to actually undergo an interrogation before a committee of, I think it was 18 men, of course, for them to be satisfied that she had the intelligence. And then they, they actually wrote a sort of letter, um, their seal of approval, when the book was published, verifying that, yes, she had satisfied them, that she was capable of doing it. And I think about that a lot, because if you think about that story and sort of extrapolate from it the analogy that there is this committee of men and they're sitting there deciding who gets to be called a writer and someone's wandering up to the gate and saying, I've written this, will you let me in? Mm -hmm. Have the optics changed that much? Who's on the committee and who's knocking at the door? And I think that's what we've got to ask ourselves when we think about classics, feminist or otherwise. Who is on the committee and who's knocking on the door? And what does the seal of approval mean? When something is given a seal of approval, what does it mean for the people who are trying to find themselves in that space as well? Yeah, that's, that's a really, really great point. Because I, I, would, I would think that a uh, classic to me is something that has endeared over a great, great period of time. But in order for a, a text to be disseminated and continually distributed like that, you know, it has to reach a particular cultural and critical consensus. Yeah. And you can't just do it alone. You can't just go out with a book and be like, hey, read this. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the internet, in a sense, has democratized things a little bit. It has made it easier to kind of disseminate and get, get the word out, so to speak. But yes, I mean, the, 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 this is a, a long-term sort of shift towards inclusiveness, you know, and, and um, it, it will take a lot of time, basically. And also, I'm very, very wary of sort of buzzwords like inclusiveness or even the idea of commodified feminism and something being a movement. We don't want something to just be a movement. You know, you don't want that, that element of tokenism, like, oh, you know, we did that, move on, back to the status quo. You know, it's, it's about very slow, gradual reprogramming, which, you know, one, mm. you know, buzzword or marketing campaign won't solve, really. Yeah. 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 Now, re I mean, so maybe we can sort of end by thinking about the idea of writing as reprogramming, writing as constitutive of feminist action, and, and ask you to think about that in relation to your work. I mean, but, and before I do that, I just want to bring in my uh, another kind of, you know, because I'm a historian of um, ideas, um, to another classic, um, who's Christine de Pizan's Book of the City of Ladies, a 16th century text, an extraordinary text which exemplifies precisely this idea about. Um, writing as constituting selfhood and power. Um, and so, there's, so it's about this woman, Christine, who's in her library in a study, a book line study, and all those books are written by men. And the world she knows has been written by men. Um, and she looks, on the pay, she looks around the walls um, and, she, and she looks at the words um, written by men and she tries to find herself she, and the only words that she can find written about her, are words that, or her sex, are words that describe her as um, stupid and irrational and um, duplicitous and vengeful and competitive. And, um, and she's feeling desperate and she says to God, you know, why did you make me a woman? And, and then out of the mists of um, the 16th century appear three ladies, Lady Reason, Lady Rectitude, and Lady Justice. And they say, Christine de Pizan, there is actually an alternative 
history. There is her story. There are a number of great women in history who I'm now going to introduce you to, and we're going to build a city of ladies. And so they build this city of ladies out of these figures, these we female figures from history, which then acts as a kind of a new world, a new city, which Christine de Pizan has created by writing it. Um, and I think that in both of your ways, you've also done that. So how, what I'd like to do uh, before we open um, the discussion up is to ask you to read from your own cities um, and just give us a bit, of, a bit of your text, your writing. I don't know who'd like to go on, Sarah. Right. I love that image, by the way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold that one in mind. Um, so I am going to read from near the middle. Um, Franny has been brought to London. She has been instantly struck by her feelings for her new mistress, um, who has decided to take her on as a lady's maid. So I guess as they would say in sort of technical terms, it's all about to go down. <laughs> um, but before it goes down, so Franny's, she's just sort of getting used to being a lady's maid and she's sitting in this very Georgian drawing room, kind of observing the woman and, this, and her, <clears throat> her mistress. Weeks passed, then a month, taking us into April. Soon they all got used to the sight of me, Meg's black on her perch at the window bench. I gazed around that room so many times. Now that Benham had had his way, the paintings were all of battlefields, bayoneted horses with rolling eyes, soldiers dying in blood. I stared through the window at the pond and the grass which was bright again and the birds which had delighted her by coming back. There were times I felt as light as an empty sack blowing on a pavement. The lady spilled in and out like dropped grains, swarmed the table, fiddling counters, biting down on them as they puzzled over their endless games of whist. There was one, Hepzibah Elliot, I noticed most of all. She watched too. She wore short sleeved dresses, a veil pinned to her hat by a jet pin that gripped her skull like a tiny hand. I disliked her on sight, her heavy brow and her small eyes and the way they followed Madame above her teacup. She had the shape of a hand barrow and a voice to match. Oh, Hep is not at all handsome, Madame said once, but she does have very handsome thoughts. I had to chew my lips so as not to laugh. There was something alike about all those ladies, silk dresses carved to neat little figures, voices fluttering like hand cloths. Only Hep Elliot was different in her shapeless gowns. As I watched them, down would come the feeling that I'd walked up to a window and was peering at them through glass. I knew I'd never belong, and then I saw all of it sharp as knives, and it hurt my eyes. Every part of me ached with wanting things I could not have. I wanted the courage of the mad to declare myself to her as if mine were the kind of suit that could ever be spoken out loud. Sometimes I felt a pulse of anger too, I'll confess it, relentless as a heart. Anger was what took me to her door. Anger and want, equal as butter and sugar in a pound cake. I took the rushlight and slipped along the third floor corridor, laid my air against the wood. I fancied I heard whispering through it. I listened for the smallest creak to tell me where she was. Was that a footstep at her desk? Was that a cabinet door banging against the wall? Was she leaning on the windowsill? Did she lie awake, as restless as me? I wanted to call out to her through the wood. I wanted to say something. I wanted to go through that door. Perhaps she was calling out to me. But the thought of knocking, moreover of what she might say if I did, filled me with dread, terror in my throat, thick as meat. I heard footsteps striking the marble downstairs and Linux crying out below. I took a deep breath and fumbled my voice down over the railing, telling her I thought I'd heard a disturbance at Madame's door. At the door, she repeated, as if it were some African word. The only disturbance up there is you. And Charlene. I'm just going to read a small section. It's my first time reading from paperback. 
new. Wait. Um, so the, the, the actress that I mentioned to act as the Pontianic is now, well, some time has passed after she has acted as the monster. Her name is Amisa, by the way. That's not actually relevant. <laughs> um, over the next few years, she tried attending open calls for Channel 8, but rejected the two roles she was offered. She refused to put talcum powder in her chignon to kowtow to concubines. She would not play the part of the frowning matriarch, the suffering Matya, the ama, or the hand-wringing spinster sister. She wanted to be at the glowing center of each story, to love and hate and fight and win, completely and without condescension, no concession to screen time, no expense spared. Why did getting older have to put a stop to her wanting? Surely it grew as she grew. Why did no one respect that? That's it. Great. Well, I'm, we're all, I hope, now at the glowing centres of all of our stories. <laughs> so I think that that um, brings our, our discussion to a con conclusion. I mean, I wanted to end with um, a quote from Chris Krause's I Love Dick. Have you read that? It's a really good title and the book's almost as good. Um, but anyway, she, she talks about um, poet men, presenters of ideas, and actress women, <coughs> presenters of themselves. Um, as a sort of bind, as the bind for women writing, presenters of themselves as opposed to presenters of ideas. And I hope that what we've done this evening is refigure, reposition um, women as um, presenters of themselves and of their fantastic ideas. Thank you for your um, attention and thank you to Charlene and Sarah.